Hi, I'm Scott Baldridge, and today we're going to talk about why unoriented Kovanov homology is useful in graph theory. This is uh, joint work with Lou Kaufman and Ben McCarty. Our talk today is going to be about well, it's going to separate into two parts. Part one is unoriented Kovanov homology, and mainly we're going to talk about the Jones polynomial. And the second part is how it relates to graph theory, how it relates to the four color theorem. Now, if you want to look up uh, the information that's in this talk, uh, you can go to unoriented virtual Kovanov homology at this archive address. So let's start with an example. Um, let's work with just the Jones polynomial and, and see what that looks like on a couple of simple examples. Here's the vir two virtual Hoff links with the opposite orientations. Uh, in this case, n plus is uh, 0, because that's a negative crossing, and n minus is 1. And over here, we have n plus is 1 and n minus is 0. Now, to compute Jones polynomial, let's just do that really quickly. Uh, I'll do some scratch work right here. So, and for the, for the Kaufman bracket, we don't have to worry about the orientation. And what we get is something that looks like this, minus q, and then the, uh, do the b smoothie. And of course this is q plus q inverse, minus q times q plus q inverse. And if we multiply that out, we just get q plus q inverse, minus q squared plus minus 1. Okay, so then the Jones polynomial for this one would be, so Jones of L of Q is going to be, um, well let's write it out first, minus 1 to the n minus Q, and then we have a normalization factor of n plus minus 2 n minus, and then we multiply by uh, the Jones polynomial of L, or the Kaufman, excuse me, the Kaufman bracket of L. And so what we get is, well in this case n minus is 1, so minus Q to the minus 2 times this polynomial. Q squared minus 1, and that's equal to minus Q inverse minus Q to the negative 3 uh, plus 1 minus Q plus Q to the minus 2. And then if we do the other one, if we do the other one, uh, the Jones polynomial of it, L prime, well, it'll have a different, it'll have, a, a, n, n minus will be 0, and n plus will be 1. <laughs> and so in that case, we get uh, 1 minus q plus q squared minus q3. And we see that these two polynomials are different, that even though the bracket doesn't require the orientation, once you get into the orientations uh, of, the, of the link, um, the Jones polynomial with this orientation is different than the Jones polynomial with that orientation. And what the idea for this paper, or for this, for this talk is, is can we generalize this so that, so that we don't need um, to worry about orientations on the links to provide a, either a Jones polynomial or a Kovanov homology? in the virtual setting. Of course, it's often useful to work with the oriented version of a Jones polynomial, say for instance, working with oriented cobordisms. But there are times when you just want to study the underlying link itself and have it be, have an invariant that's defined independent of the choice of an orientation. Now, in the 1980s, Morton showed how to define a Jones polynomial for an unoriented classical link. And in a lot of ways, what we're doing here is, is based on that. But there's a issue when you get to virtual links. In other words, the, the virtual links, it becomes a lot trickier as to 
what is what should be the definition and and what does that definition look like what are some of the properties that we want to preserve that that happen with the classical Jones polynomial, can we preserve those properties? So that's really at, at issue what's happening here. Next, let's look at a simple version of an unoriented Jones polynomial. We can get a sense of what to do with a virtual link by looking at a classical link. And in that case, um, let's, so let's do an example. Um, in that case, we separate the different types of crossings. This is a classical example. It's a trefoil kind of with a linked with a uh, figure eight. And what you can see is that, that well, what, what you notice is that you can break down the different types of crossings into either what are called mixed crossings, where the, the one link is, is linking with, an, with the other link. The one component is linking with the other component. And self crossings, in other words, where the component is crossing with itself. And if we do that, um, this, is, this is essentially how you, you can build an unoriented Jones polynomial and, of course, an unoriented Kovanoff homology uh, by studying where the, where the components link themselves and where they link each other. And for that, for the, for the, when they link, them, link each other, we don't actually worry about whether it's positive or negative. So we put an orientation on. Now, we don't actually need an orientation to get whether something on a self-link, whether it's positive or negative, and I'll ex explain that in a second. But it's often helpful to, to put an orientation to, to find that. Now, if we go through this, we see oh, we got a negative here and a negative here, and of course a negative here. And on, over here on the figure eight, we've got a positive, and here's a positive, and here's a negative, and here's a negative. And then on the, on the self link, or in the mixed linking, we have a mixed link here, a mixed link here, a mixed link, mixed crossing here, and a mixed crossing there. So writing all this down, we see that we have, so we've got two positive crossings, and we have one, two, three, and just add them all up. You add up all the, all the negative, all the self crossing negative self-crossings for both for both knots. So we got one, two, three, four, five negative self-crossings, and we have one, two, three, four mixed crossings. Now, the easy version of an unoriented Jones polynomial, and it's one of the one of the polynomials we describe in our paper, is to just say that J naught, we'll use uh, J0 to be kind of like the, the basic one of Q is going to be minus 1 to the minus s minus minus m over 2 and then normalization factor that should look familiar s plus minus 2 s minus that's like the n plus minus 2 n minus but then we're going to subtract half of the mixed crossings again and then we'll just use the Kaufman bracket so in this particular case, uh, for the T8, we get that J of T8 of Q is going to be minus 1 to the minus 5 minus 2 for the mixed crossings. And Q, we've got 2 plus minus 10 and then minus 2 again L. And it turns out that this, this polynomial, normalized in this way, is independent of how we chose the orientations that we use to find the positive and negative. Now, you might say, well, you, you chose an orientation. And actually, I didn't. Uh, I didn't have to. Um, I, can look at, I can look at starting at the bottom and, or starting at the top and follow through. And if I go, if I'm going from, uh, from left to right, when I return, that will be a negative crossing. And if I pop, follow through and I'm going from right to left, that'll be a positive crossing. So I didn't, it, it's useful to pick an orientation to, to find out what S plus and S minus is, but um, we didn't actually need it. Uh, this, is, this goes back to the old saying that if you reverse an orientation on a knot, um, 
you'll still get the same number of positive and negative crossings. So, um, so those, those are well-defined independent of choosing an orientation. And notice that for the mixed crossings, we didn't, we didn't care whether they were positive or negative. Okay, but look what happens when we uh, look at the virtual Hofflink, the two virtual Hofflink examples that we had from before. Um, they look like this. One was, L was this. And we see that here we have, um, uh, well, we don't have any, any self-linkings or self-crossings, but we do have one mixed crossing. So here M is equal to one. And so J of L of Q is equal to minus one to the negative one half. And then we have Q to the zero, zero, negative one half. And then the, oops, this is actually T sub 8. Uh, negative Q to the negative 1 half of L. And it didn't matter whether I used this one or the other one because um, with the other one it had the uh, N plus, this was N minus uh, was 1 and the other one was N plus is equal to 1, but they both have M equal to 1. So both of them look like that. Um, and you can see that this is how, how this, this normalization gives you the same, same um, polynomial regardless of the orientation. However, you look at that really quickly, you see that now we have an introduced complex roots, a complex coefficients. So if we take minus one to the one half, negative one half power, this is actually minus i times q to the negative one half. Now I don't worry so much about q to the, being to a fractional power. Um, that can all be factored into how we set up the uh, um, homological gratings and, and quantum gratings and Kovanoff homology, and, and certainly it's no problem with, with having fractional power polynomials. Um, but this i, this negative i here, is a problem. Um, one other thing to note, and this will become important later, that if I take J L of this, and that this is, these are these are circles, uh, J L of one. If you go back and plug one into to either of the two polynomials that we had on the earlier slide, they both are zero. So th again, this is starting to show you that s things that happen in virtual virtual not theory or virtual link theory is in fact different than what's happening in the regular Jones polynomial. Uh, in the regular Jones polynomial for a not, if you or for a link, if you plug in one into the Jones polynomial, you get two to the number of components. So here, this is not behaving like a classical link invariant or the classical Jones polynomial, excuse me. All right, so now, so the good news, so the good news is that uh, we can define an unoriented uh, Jones polynomial just simply by doing this and um, using those as our, th that as our, as our um, calculation. And it's independent of the orientation chosen. You can see that from just trying this example out with the, uh, with the virtual Hofflink. And, um, but the bad news is that now these uh, complex numbers are creeping up um, it's not true anymore that, that the Jones polynomial of a vert, uh, when, you, when you evaluate it at one, is giving you two to the power of the number of components. And, you know, we have to live with fractional, fractional uh, powers of Q, but that's fine. Okay, so the next step is to, to um, what, what we want to do is modify J naught to get a, get a different type of polynomial. And what we're going to do instead is it's going to be very similar to this, but we're going to add in one more factor. We're going to add in that minus S minus minus M over 2, and then Q to the S plus minus, keep that the same, oops. Q 
keep that the same. S plus minus 2, S minus, minus M over 2. And then, of course, just the regular Kaufman break bracket. And what happens is that this is the, this will be the, with this extra factor here, this will be the, uh, the unoriented Jones polynomial, and it will lead to an un unoriented Kovanov hom uh, homology that has the properties that we want. Uh, in particular, name it, it, it becomes, um, for example, the, the minus here will actually become the standard minus 1 to the n minus when, when your link is classical. Um, so, so now by introducing this extra lambda factor, uh, we'll be able to get rid of the fact that the, that complex numbers are showing up here. And we'll even get uh, something that's even better, which is that when you apply 1 to, to the Jones polynomial of, the, of this unoriented, this unoriented uh, polynomial, it'll always be non-negative. It might be 0, as in the, in the virtual Hoff case, but it'll at least be non-negative. It will not be complex and it will be non-negative. And that's exactly what we're going to need for the graph theory. Okay. All right, so we cleaned up the board and now we're to the actual version of the Jones problem. The, the J naught was just a, was a kind of a starter version. So this one is almost like the J naught except for it has this lambda tilde. Uh, this part and this part is independent, doesn't require any choice of of any orientation to begin with. However, this one does, the, the til lambda tilde. But as one of the nice things about lambda tilde as we define it um, is that it, it, it will change as you change orientations, but minus one to it won't. All right, so what is, what is lambda tilde? Uh, lambda tilde is a modified linking number. So we're going to see that it will define it for you, define it in a second, but it's a modified linking number. It depends on, as a linking number, it, uh, tilde, lambda tilde depends on a choice of orientation. But, but any two, but in any, but any two uh, orientations so any two lambdas uh, given, given by uh, any two choices of orientation uh, differ an even number. So because of that, that means that even though you, you, use, a, you use the orientation to define lambda, um, at the end of the day, uh, that, that number, this number here, will be independent of the orientation chosen. And then the other thing that's nice about lambda is that lambda tilde minus s minus minus m over 2 is just equal to n minus when L is classical or even. So I'll explain what even is in a second. Um, so, but the main point is, is that this just reduces, this, this should tell you something already. That what we have here is going to be a, a integer. So even though this can be fractional uh, for virtual links, and this is fractional for virtual links, when you sum them all up together, you just get your regular n minus. So, so that's a nice feature of this, and an important feature. Um, the other nice thing about J tilde of L of when you apply one, to, when you evaluate it at one, it's either going to be two to the number of components 
if L is even, and zero if L is odd. So now it's important, it's important to say that um, because, be, well, it's important to say what L, what even means. And even, there's, there's like 37 different definitions of even in virtual link theory. Uh, just like, there's a definition for even uh, for virtually every paper, it seems like. Um, there's like, in fact, there's several different uh, evens in our paper. Uh, but for this, for this talk, even just simply means that if you travel around a component, you'll intersect and you'll, you'll find an even, you'll run into an even number of mixed components or mixed crossings. So that if you look at uh, the mixed crossings for any given component, it's an even number. And then if they're all even, if every component is even, then the link is called even. Uh, if there's any one that, that runs into a odd number of mixed crossings as you go around the, go around the component, then if there's just one odd, then, then the whole link is called odd. So for example, the Hoff link is, is an odd link. All right. Um, one other thing to note is that because of what's happening, well, in, in fact, we can say that we can say the following, and this is also important. Uh, J tilde of L of Q um, is now no longer uh, fractional valued or, or, or complex valued, it's integral, integral value. But now it's in possibly uh, variables with fractional power, half powers. So that's also nice. And that means that uh, um, we, get, we get rid of the possibility of running into plugging one in and, and finding out that it's a complex number times two to the number of comp uh, components. Okay, so let's, next step is let's define lambda and define how do, what do we mean by a, a modified linking number. To define lambda, one of the big problems is in virtual link theory is the fact that that we can get odd links, that where the mixed crossings, there's an odd number of mixed crossings on a, on a given component. And, and for that reason, you'll see, oftentimes see a lot of invariance about even links, but then when you get to the odd link version, it kind of deteriorates or breaks down. So, uh, and, don't, and there's lots of wonderful ways that, that people have gotten around that issue, and I, I don't mean to, to say anything more than um, it's a problem. So, so to define lambda, we have to find some way of taking our odd link and, and breaking it up into pieces that are even. And in doing so, we get uh, what we found that, that works well is to build something that's called the core of a link and the mantle of a link. And the core st starts like this. So one, we define, so define L equal to the core union with the mantle. So this, think of like uh, the earth has the core of the earth and the mantle is the kind of the crust. And so what we have is the, that this will always be the even part or this will be uh, an even link all by itself and this will be what's ever left over, essentially. And when I say it, when I write it like this, um, I'm thinking of the core as its own link, all, you know, and, and the mantle is its own link. That only when you put them together that you see them linking with each other. So, as follows. So one, A, delete all components that have an odd number, have an odd number of classical crossings.
In other words, we're going to go through the whole, the whole link. Imagine a link that has a thousand different components. And whenever we run into uh, a component that has an, that where its mix crossings is odd, um, then delete it. Delete it from, from, from the link. Uh, when, you, when you've done that, B, the new link, and this link may or may not be, uh, you know, it's very likely that this new link is actually disconnected from itself, um, a split link. Um, this new link is even or odd. So do step A again. On this new link, and of course, once you do now, here's the problem. Once you start deleting um, odd links or odd components, after you delete the odd component, then the component that's remaining, well, that may now it what might have been even, but now it's odd um, because that 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 component that you just deleted um, is gone from it, and uh, especially in a virtual situation like in the Hoff link, if I delete one of the components, well, in that case, that that component's even, but Suppose that it was half linked with another component. Well, then that new comp that new link that you got, well, that that link will be odd. So do step A again, and then and then um, you get a new set that ha might have some odd components, and again. So keep doing this again and again until you get. A link that is even. Call it C1. Now, and write and write and say let L equals C1 union M1. So now you go back and you throw in all the things that you deleted, and you let you you've now decomposed L into something that when you remove M1 completely, uh, what you have left over is just an even link. All right, the next step is to look at two. Uh, M1 could be can be odd or even. So we can do step one to M1. So we can just think of M1 as its link all by itself, and then we can uh, well then we can we can ask for its core. So do step one on M1 to get well now L is equal to C1 union C2, union M2. Or this part right here is the, is, uh, M, was the original M1. Okay, finally, three, I'm going to have to switch to another color, three, just repeat on M, now M2 is an, a new mantle, now you've got two cores, and so repeat, on M2, step two. Ooh. And then repeat over and over again. So until you get to get, well, to get L is equal to C1 union C2 union union CK union MK. And then this whole thing is the core. And there's the last mantle. Sorry about the... Okay. It's the final mantle. But all of these, now, now let's take a look at what's happening here. 
what, what you would have to imagine is happening is that, that you start with your, your big thousand component link and you start deleting all the odd components and um, that creates new odd components and then you delete all of those. Keep doing that until you get down to something where you, when you delete all the odd components, all you have are even components and that's C1. Now you, then you, everything remaining is M1. So that M1 might be a, a big group of you know 500 uh, different components and you do that to M1 so you go down and you find a, a core for it and and so that gives you a new set of, of, of components that are all linking each other evenly each so C1 was even now C2 as its own link is even and you just keep doing this and so it's a, you know we describe it to ourselves as like Swiss cheese you're you're you're, you're basically getting all these core pocket holes and then the rest of it, the mantle, is the, is the actual cheese part. And at the very end you have just this one last thing that could be, MK could be empty, in which case you have a bunch of even cores that when you union mold it together you get this odd, this odd link. Um, <clears throat> but in general, um, it, it, it's just, there's just going to be a mantle. And the nice thing about, about even and having having these is that, well, if your if your link is even to begin with, um, if it's classical, for example, the first time you delete all the odd component, well, there's nothing to delete. So right away, uh, L becomes the core, and so anything defined um, that's being defined via classical um, just immediately gets picked up. Okay, we're now ready to. Now that we have the core and we have these uh, uh, independent links, we can now define a modified linking number, and it's the modified linking number that will give us lambda. Let me erase and we'll, we'll get started again. Okay, so we're back. Uh, switch colors. Um, we have L is decomposed into a uh, set of core link, even core links, and then possibly one odd link um, sitting at the end. And now we can define um, the, a modified linking number between two, co uh, two components um, with each other. So here's how that looks. Let's start right here. So I'm going to define link tilde of k1 or ki kj to be the following. So if, if uh, Ki and Kj are in some core, and it has to be, they have to be in the same core. If they're in the same core, it's just the regular linking number. And so, for example, if you have a classical link, then the whole classical length is C1, and so linking the, the, the modified linking number just becomes the linking number. And if it's not, if they're in different, core, different cores or, um, or in the mantle, or one's in the core and one's in the mantle, then it's going to be a number given by a positive or negative one, and I'll explain what it is in a second, times the regular linking number. So otherwise, and so now we need to define what epsilon is. Epsilon of ki, kj is also a little bit tricky, but it, it seems strange at the beginning, but wow, does it work. It's minus one to the linking number K I K J if M I J is even. And what is M I J? M I J is just the uh, M I J is just simply the number of mixed crossings between K I and K J. And then so if it's even, then then um, then this is an integer and we're good. This will be uh, um, you can take minus one to it. If it's odd, if M and IJ are odd, then this is a half integer and that would be a problem. So, 
So we just have to separate these into two cases and force one of them to be, well, force, well, well, you'll see, kj plus one half. So in this case, this will be an odd, this will be a fractional, fractional uh, um, with, uh, it'll be some, num some multiple of one half, but then when you add the half, then it'll be an integer again, and then take minus one to it. So the epsilon is just doing a flip on off, positive negative, on the, on the linking number when ki and kj are in different components. All right, so with that understood, then bkm 20, we define the modified linking number to be just what you expect. i less than j, linking number of ki kj. And this, because, because we're dealing with uh, virtual links and some of the links can be odd, um, the linking number here is, could clearly still be a fractional. So we still are in z1, z uh, multiples of one half. And, um, but this is now, this is an oriented, oriented link invariant. But it has one nice feature, and that's important. But minus one to lambda tilde is independent of the choice of orientation. So once you once you define this quantity and you take it to minus one to the power, um, that gives you, that's when you see that you've got uh, um, an orientation independent um, quantity. Okay, so what do we have now? We have the, uh, the Jones polynomial, the unoriented Jones polynomial with the lambda tilde as defined that acts like a linking number um, and is the linking number in the case of, of a classical link. Um, but together with this and, and the, and the um, normalization factor actually gives us an unoriented version of the, of the Jones polynomial. We now have an unoriented link invariant in, in the Jones polynomial, and we have a similar thing for Coven ophthalmology. And what's the next part of the talk is I want to explain how that particular Jones polynomial, that particular unoriented Jones polynomial, is really useful in, in terms of graph theory. So this goes back to a paper of mine from 2018, and in it, it uses the following, it has a similar, uh, and this is where we noticed that the, uh, this is where we noticed actually in, in virtual link theory that this happened, is that this property that you see here holds for uh, the two-factor polynomial for planar graphs, namely, um, so let, I'm just going to show you what the two-factor looks like, and then we'll get into the definitions a little later. We'll, we'll show an example. So the two-factor, and I'll explain what it means. The two-factor poly of a planar graph also has this property. So here's an example of a, of a two-factor polynomial on a planar graph. And when you evaluate it at one, well, in this case, it's going to be two squared or four. And you don't know why that's the case, but just take it, take it from me for a moment. Um, when you look at a graph, when you're looking at a graph, to uh, compute the two-factor polynomial, you always need a perfect matching. And so throughout, I'll, I'll, I'll just draw every graph with um, straight lines for the perfect matching edges and basically circles for the, for the, what, re for the what remains. A perfect matching just pairs uh, 
um, a set all the vertices up via a set of edges. So this this matches these two vertices. This edge matches these two vertices, and so on. So in this case, um, what I want you to do is start to think of graphs, so just like uh, you would think of um, a virtual link, and. In that, you got to say, well, what are the components of the link? And in this case, the components of the link are the two, the two uh, circles, the two cycles that are not part of the perfect matching. And then what are the crossings? Well, the crossings are going to be the edges, the perfect matching edges. And look at, lo and behold, if you have two, a, a two-component graph of minus its perfect matching, and there, it's even, so this is an even, has an even number of, of vertices on the component, and an even number of vertices on the component here, then it's reporting two to the number, to the number of those components. Uh, let's see this over and over again. So for example, if we calculated this example instead, and you actually calculated it, go, go through the whole process of computing the, the two-factor polynomial, and, and then plug one in, what you find is that it's zero. And this may also makes sense because you have two components, again, but the number of perfect matchings between the components is three. In other words, there's the cycle, it's, the cycle itself has got three, link three, one, two, three. So, so this would be considered an odd, an odd uh, perfect matching. So the this, this similar statement is going to be, uh, it's two to the number of components when the graph has an even perfect matching, and it's going to be zero if the graph has an odd, if the, if the perfect matching's odd. Okay, why do we call it the two-factor? Two uh, because this number right here is reporting to us the number of two-factors that span the perfect matchings. So let's do an example. So here's an example of that. Do it with the even one. And what you see is that, that there are, let me just count them. A, a two cycle is, is, a, is a basically a, 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 a cycle of, of edges such that the, that the cycles cover all of the perfect matching edges. And so if you try to count all the different ways of, of drawing um, circles on the graph such that they, they go through the two perfect matching edges, you get the following. And just a little box. So the number there is Here's the beauty. So in the next step, I'm going to show you why, why having two factors that span perfect matching, perfect matching, uh, perfect matchings, is so valuable, and it's related. This is the part that's related to the four coloring. Okay, give me a second. Okay. So how do you turn a two factor into a, a four face coloring of the graph, especially if it's planar? And it's really easy. So let's take a look. So here's a two-factor, the, just the square two-factor in the examples I was showing on the previous board. And you can, with a two-factor, you can just go around and labeling red, purple, red, purple, red, purple until you uh, um, complete the, the two-factor. And then what you notice is that you can just replace any of the, you can replace the, uh, the, the other edges with a third color, like blue. So if we do this, we get It's called a three-edge coloring. So this is blue, and this is blue, purple, purple, and red, and red. And then Tate, a good friend Tate, showed us that there's a way to actually turn a three-edge coloring, a Tate color, it's oftentimes called a Tate coloring, into a four-face coloring. And I won't go through how that how that's done here, but it's really lovely. And if you get a chance, go read about it. But you basically say let the outside face be white, and then blue times white is blue, 
and then blue times red is purple. There's a multiplication. So that white times purple is purple, and uh, white times blue is blue. And there you go. So if G has a perfect matching, such that G with its perfect matching, it depends on the perfect matching, 2 of 1 is greater than 0, then G can be 4-colored. Pretty cool. And it's okay if your perfect matching, like we were looking at the perfect matching um, you know, we were looking at the perfect matching here with the three, and that was an odd perfect matching, right? And, and that was a problem, but there exists another perfect matching, one where you switch it. This one, this one, and this one. And then that one, you see that there's actually two coloring, or two, two, two factors that, that go through that. So those would look like this. Um, there's one of them. And the other one would look like this. They have to go through those. And there's another way to do it. Two, two. So those are the two, those are that's a that's a, a two fact two two factors that that go through this perfect matching not that one, and then of course these are valid uh, two factors, and so they produce a coloring, like so. So it's not so much that we have to worry about every perfect matching producing a coloring. Some of them may may produce colorings, some may not. It's the fact that at least one of them produces a coloring. So. That brings up the question of how do how did the how does the two factor polynomial, um, this thing that is calculating the number of two factors, how does that relate to uh, the original Jones polynomial? So let me erase this and, and we'll, we'll work on that. How does the two factor polynomial relate to the Jones polynomial? And to understand that, let's go back and look at the Kaufman brackets. Uh, the, basically, it, it resides in the Kaufman bracket. And there's, these are similarly defined polynomials in a lot of ways. So uh, if we define the Kaufman bracket, so. Everybody should be familiar with that. The two-factor bracket looks very similar, but it's on a graph. It has a unique feature that it introduces a, a cross instead of instead of kind of resolving the other way. Um, but this is okay in graph theory, and actually it's okay in virtual link theory as well. So because that would just be a virtual crossing. Um, so they're different in that respect, but in terms of the evaluations on the loops, um, they're the same. So in Jones, it's usually this, and and in the two-factor, it's the same thing. Now, this looks so close to one another that, that uh, um, you might think that there's homology theories for them, and there is indeed homology theories. Okay, the categorification of the Jones polynomial, as we all know, is a Kobanoff. And it turns out that, that you can categorify this two-factor polynomial, and if you do that, um, that's my work from 2018. Now, um, this is these two theories are actually different theories. Um, this one has to be invariant under the Reitermeister moves and the virtual Reitermeister moves. This one's uh, invariant under a completely different set of moves called the flip moves, and they're they're meant to be uh, the the moves that would preserve what you would usually expect out of a graph. Um, in fact, they, it can, you can push it all the way to two isomorphism on graphs, and that's, we won't get into that. 
but but the point is is that these moves these moves and these moves look really different from one another so even though um, they're you can already start to see how one would define the homology here. Well, you know how to define the homology here. You can define the homology here in exactly the same way that you define the homology of Kovanov. And it turns out that, that through a lot of hard work, you can show that that, that, that homology is invariant under the different, different moves that happen in the two-factor. Now, so very, very soon, there's going to be a new paper, maybe within the next month on the archive, that goes into how to make the, the best of both of these, of these worlds. And uh, it's a paper by me, uh, Lou Kaufman, and Will Rushworth. And if you don't know Will, he's on the market this year. He's an assistant. He wants to become an assistant professor. Highly suggest you look at him. Uh, he's a very clever guy, absolutely uh, worthy of your attention on that matter. Now, so the two-factor for the planar is defined just like this, and it's, it's perfectly OK. But it runs into problems if you want to think about a non-planar graph. So first of all, we need to really start to think of um, how, how planar graphs look and behave like links. And you can start to see some of the similarities. The perfect matching is going to play somehow the role of a, of a, uh, of a crossing. And um, so let's erase this, and, and I'll show you what that looks like next. OK, so here's a picture of a planar uh, trivalent graph with a perfect matching. The perfect matchings are, again, the straight edges. And then the, um, the circular edges are uh, the, the components. And we want to understand what this looks like. And like, when I look at this, I actually think of it almost like a link. And the link for me is each of the edges that are uh, like a crossing and the components of the link are the circular pieces. So this would be a three component link. And now you have to understand what, what does it mean to be a positive crossing or negative crossing for, for, an, for a perfect matching edge. And that's pretty straightforward too. If you put, a, put an orientation on it, let's do the same orientation here and here. Let's put a different orientation on it, that one. And what we see is that either the arrows are going in the same direction along a perfect matching edge or as in this case or in this case, but in this case, they're going in opposite directions at, the per at that perfect matching edge. So the way to define uh, a, a positive crossing would be something that looked like this. So this would be a positive crossing. And if they're going in the same direction, that would be a negative crossing. In this way, we can start to really think of, of just gra trivalent graphs as uh, like virtual links. And the beauty of, of, this, of, this, uh, uh, of this type of thinking is that you can, you can stop, stop worrying about playing with just planar graphs. So there's a couple of nice things that happen with planar graphs. With, with, with a non-planar graph, of course, it's, it's going to be something that has like what you would expect, a virtual crossing. So a, a non-planar graph would look like, like this. That would be a nice example of a non-planar graph. And, and what you see is that this would be like a virtual crossing. So, so again, there's going to be some nice aspects of, of planar graphs. In, in particular, you can always choose a planar graph so that, that there's only always positive crossings. I'll let that be an exercise for you. But when you get to non-planar graphs like this one, you see that there is really no way to define, get out of this being a negative crossing. And so what would be nice to have is, with the two-factor polynomials, to have, think of it having a normalization factor like the Jones polynomial does, in which it behaves nicely for nonplanar graphs. So let's do an example here with this graph and show that, that with, with these types of, and these are called ribbon graphs, um, with these types of ribbon graphs, you actually get negative results on the two-factor polynomial. 
So here, let's just calculate it. Okay. This is going to be a whole thing. Minus Q, well, square cross. Here we see that in this case, we have one circle, and in this case, we have two circles. And there's the second, and the second, the first one here. So it's like u plus q universe, minus q times q plus q universe squared. We have two circles. We get a double for that. That's equal to minus q cubed, minus q. And then if you insert 1 into the polynomial, we see, well, plugging 1 into that gives us minus 2. And this is not helpful because if we're, if we're looking at all the different perfect matchings, sure, this one says, this one says that there's a perfect matching here. Uh, there's a two-factor coloring, and, and you can see what it is. It, it just follows around the edge, or takes one of the, goes through the perfect matching and then uses one of the other edges, and then you do the other, other way. So you can see that there's two, but this minus two causes problems because we don't know... Uh, if you're going to sum up over all perfect matchings, this would be start to subtract away colorings. And we don't want to subtract away colorings. We want to, to, to add, add all the colorings. And so at this point, we really need for this to be a positive number. But just as you might expect, the normalization that uses exactly the same, same uh, normalization factor as we did for the, for the unoriented Jones polynomial, that thing works. So, if you look at the normalization of the two-factor polynomial, and we'll call it G M twiddle two of Q is equal to. Well, we're just going to use exactly the same uh, same un, uh, unoriented uh, normalization that we used for the uh, for the for the virtual links which is negative 1 to the lambda twiddle uh, minus s minus minus m over 2 um, times q of s plus minus 2s minus minus m over 2 of the regular the regular uh, two-factor polynomial. And just to remind ourselves that this is all this all makes sense Right here, up in this picture, we can easily calculate which ones are our pluses and minuses. Um, so this would be a uh, this would be a self-crossing because it's on this, it goes from the cro from the, the component to itself, and it would be a plus. And this one, these would be pluses. Plus on a planar graph, they're all pluses. And then um, these are going together. That's a, that would well. This is these are between components. So this would be a mixed component, mixed mixed crossing, mixed crossing, mixed crossing, mixed crossing. So in this case, uh, we have um, m is equal to one, two, three, four, five, and s plus is equal to one, two, three, and of course s minus is zero. And in just the same way, you can calculate um, a linking a linking number between the different components on a, on a trivalent graph with a perfect matching. And so this makes sense, and this makes sense, this makes sense, and that makes sense. And now we're ready for the punchline of the talk. So let me erase this, and, and we'll put up the punchline. As I just showed you on the last board, sometimes when you calculate a, a two-factor polynomial for a non a non-planar graph, it can be plus or negative the number of components. Um, we'd like for that to be positive, and the thing that's going to make it positive is exactly the same uh, uh, normalization factor that we use for the unoriented uh, Jones polynomial. And so, what does that look like? It looks like this. So here's the theorem. So if you take a graph with a perfect matching, and you take its, its normalized perfect matching, and you take the two-factor polynomial, and then you plug one into the normalized two-factor polynomial, then it's equal to, well, just what you'd expect, the number of cycles of G minus M. And those are just, those are, remember, those are just the, the circle components. Uh, if m is even, 
So I'm running out of room. And it's zero if m is odd. So if m is an even perfect matching, um, then you compute it, and then you, it picks up the exactly the right number of, of uh, the exact same count as you would get in Jones polynomial. And just like in the virtual uh, unoriented virtual link theory for 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 virtual links, you get zero in the case that you have just like the, the virtual link being having an odd number of components. If you have an odd number of uh, odd length cycle in G minus M, then um, it'll zero out the the two-factor polynomial. So, uh, why would you like that? Because of this following theorem. So that's using this normalization. So, if you sum over all the perfect matchings, and what do I mean by that? We, we, the beautiful thing that can happen on a trivalent graph that you really don't get to get away with in a, in a virtual link is that if you don't like one perfect matching, there's other perfect matchings of the edges uh, that are available to you. Now, in some ways, what you should think of a, of, of a trivalent graph in this regard is actually a, uh, not just corresponding to a single um, virtual link, but actually corresponding to all the different types of virtual links, uh, one for each of the perfect matchings on the, on the original graph. So uh, the way I think about it is, is a trivalent graph is a set of virtual links. So if you sum over all the perfect matchings, you get this really nice formula. You, you integrate out the, the dependence on the perfect matchings, and you get what's called the Tate polynomial. So that's just M is in a perfect matching set, and then you just take the normalized perfect matching, or the normalized two-factor polynomial. And by the way, all this, all this continues to work in terms of building a Co Co uh, building Kovanoff-like theories, the Baldrige theory, homo homology theory as well. So, in 2020, later this year, maybe 21 sometime in that frame frame. Um, let G, there'll be a paper out that says, let G be a planar graph. Or just any graph, doesn't have to be planar. Let's be careful, that's the whole point of this, this theorem. Let G be any graph, be any trivalent graph. Then TQ of 1, or TG of 1, is equal to the number of three edge colorings. Of G. So that leads us to, so in particular, if we restrict it to if we restrict it to planar graphs, it says that if Tg of 1 is greater than 0 for all planar graphs, then well, that means that means that, that there's a perfect matching that has a non-trivial uh, has non-trivial two factors um, that are valid two factors, and those two factors can be colored with Tate colorings, three edge colorings. That's the number here, and of course, a three edge coloring then implies that you can have a four face coloring. So, if this is always true, uh, then you get four color theorem. Um, you might say, you know, that's a that that's the you know that's the punchline, right? The punchline is um, this thing, which was well defined for planar graphs, uh, with you know without the without the uh, um, the normalization that was well defined for planar graphs, 
But if you want to go beyond planar graphs and talk about uh, non-planar ribbon graphs, um, then you use this. You can use this normalization here, and with that normalization, you get um, a well-defined polynomial that you can then sum over all the perfect matchings, and this gives you a, 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 polynomial, a new polynomial invariant of all ribbon graphs. You think of this as a ribbon graph. Um, that is, it's an invariant of the of the ribbon graph. In particular, when you plug one in. It gives you the total number of colorings of that of that ribbon graph, uh, three edge colorings, and then then some of those may you know like then 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 the question is is um, well that can be then used to to color uh, um, the planar planar graphs with with um, four colorings on the faces if it's planar. If it's not if it's if the if the ribbon graph which corresponds to a surface. Um, if that ribbon graph um, doesn't satisfy certain conditions, it's not clear that you can then put a, a four-face four coloring on a non-S2 uh, surface. But um, this gives a, definitely a way of, of studying ribbon graphs, of thinking of graphs as knots and links, of attacking uh, interesting problems in graph theory. And, um, and to be honest, um, I'm not. This isn't where I, where I'm thinking, of, where my, where my research is going. Where I'm thinking about, because we already know that that's true. Uh, where I'm interested in is that each of these ribbon graphs actually form surfaces, and it's those surfaces. I'm a topologist, so it's those surfaces that I'm interested in. And essentially, what we have is a, uh, are, are different ways of, of, understanding those surfaces by giving it a cell structure. It's a very, if you have really nice cell structures, um, you can understand them in terms of, of essentially a Kovanoff-like theory, the Baldrige homology. And, and it's in understanding those surfaces that um, I plan to, with any luck, uh, um, use the, that understanding to, to understand things like uh, the moduli space, space of stable curves. So I've got you know, hopefully you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you liked it. Hope you, hope you have, uh, saw some something in there that you could play with. And I hope you go play because it's fun to play with all this all this neat technology. Um, go read those papers. Uh, in the on the next board, I'll I'll put up some uh, um, a list of all the papers that you can go look at. And I appreciate you appreciate you listening and watching till this point. And uh, thank you very much. Bye bye.